These are made up things. This is our tradition been transmitted. And he gave us a whole new Imamatic Atana Qaeda. He gave us an incredible Qaeda. And if you know this Qaeda, inshallah you'll never go astray. Imamatic was asked, Man ahli bid'ati wa ahwa? Who are the people of bid'a and ahwa? And this su'al is muwafaq. It's an incredible jawab. He said, Ahli bid'ati wa ahwa? كل من سمع أنفسهم بغير ما سماهم الله وهو وهو المسلمون فمن أهل البدعة والأهواء anyone that calls themselves a name other than Muslimun is from the people of bid'ah and أهواء so any group that has the fact that they're a group and they have a name and this is not uh, a name like Maliki or something or Hanafi because that's intisab لشيوخ أجمعت الأمة على هدايتهم. If somebody says he's Maliki, that is not the same because that is telling you where your source of knowledge came from based on iman that the entire Umma has agreed on their guidance. In other words, if somebody says that Maliki doesn't go under that or Hanafi or Shafi'i Hanbali, those four, anybody that says I'm Maliki, Hanafi, Shafi'i or Hanbali, those those are rightly guided. If they're really following what those imams came, because those four imams were Muslim alim alim arba, waqafu ghairihim al-jami al-manah. It's Muslim alim. Those four imams is Muslim alim. It's absolutely by consensus that they're rightly guided. And so people calling to other than that. And then in aqidah, you take very simple aqidah from a simple matan like Ibn Ashar, Imam Tahawi, any of those, and don't go into furuwa, faraiyat. Where is Allah? Uh, what's uh, Allah has a? What's the hand like? What's the, all these type things? All that is. Somebody came to me and they asked me. Somebody came to me and they said, "What do you say about the ayah Ar Rahman Al Al Arsh Istawa?" And I said, "The fact they ask you that question is a sign they have deviation in their heart by the shahada of the Quran, because the Quran says anyone that asks about those verses, that means their hearts are deviated. So anytime you hear people talking about the verses of Allah." That relate to mutashabihat, hazy things. I will be that. I will be that. You just leave them, and that, and that's guidance. Firm foundation in what we're doing. It's the one that has the highest incentive for something that gives us sabit, yusabitunna, give us a firm foundation. Madam, you can see in karun the imamihim, fayarjiun lahu fi akhamim. As long as there's nothing in it that is rejected by their imam, so if you're a Maliki, as long as it's not some of your imam rejects, or a Hanafi, that Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu, or Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmad radiallahu anhu, in their rulings, لِأَنَّ عُلَمَاءَ الْأَحْكَامِ قَدْ هَذَّبُوا وَنَقْفَحُوا وَأَبْطَرُوا فِي الْأَدِلَّةِ وَصَحَّهُوا فَلَزِمَ اتِّبَاعُهُمْ فِي مَا أَوْضَحُوا وَاعْتِمَادُهُمْ فِي مَا صَحَّهُوا so he says, because the ulama of these legal rulings, they have rarefied, they have purified, they have rejected those things that are false. There's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, يَحْمِلُونَ هَذَا الدِّينَ مِنْ كُلِّ قَرْنٍ عُدُولُهُ In every generation, the people who will carry this deen are trustworthy people. And they will yanfun anhu. They will reject the ta'wil, ta'atil al ghalin, wa intihal al muqtilin, wa ta'wil al jahilin. They will reject tahrif al ghalin, the changes made by the extremists. They will reject the things that people who try to negate the deen, intihal al muqtilin, people that try to detract from Islam, to take the teeth out of it to remove its rulings and its strength, and the ta'wil al-jahideen, the interpretation of ignorant people. So in every generation, there will be people that will emerge to protect the deen. And because of that, the greatest of them were the four imams, after the, obviously the sahaba, radiallahu the tabi'in, the greatest of them were the four imams and their rightly guided scholars. So we follow them because they rejected certain delils and they corrected other ones and verified their soundness. And therefore, it is necessary to follow them in what they have clarified to us and to depend upon them in what they have purified of this teaching.
and found to be true. فَالصُوفِ لَا يُفَارِقُ السَّلَفِ فِي مُعْتَقَدِهِ And therefore, the Sufi does not deviate from the first community in his belief. وَلَا يُخَارِفُ الْفُقَهَاءَ فِي مُعْتَمَدِهِ And he does not disagree with the jurists, the scholars of jurisprudence, in what he depends upon from his legal rulings. لِأَنَّ الْعَقَائِدَ رَأْسُ مَالِهِ وَالْأَحْكَامَ أَسَاسُ أَعْمَالِهِ Because the credo beliefs that he founds his deen upon is his capital. And the legal rulings is the foundation of his actions. فَالْمُخَاطَرَةُ بِهِمَا ضَرَرٌ So to take any risks with these two by following things that are not sound, agreed upon, is dangerous and harmful. وَالْعَمْلُ بِغَيْرِ الْمَذْهَبَيْنِ الْمَذْكُرَيْنِ فِيهِمَا غَرَرٌ And acting according to other than the aforementioned two schools or two methodologies has غَرَر in it. There's deception in it. You're being deceived. You're being tricked. ذُمَّ هُمْ فِي الْفَضَائِرِ عَلَى مَذْهَبِ أَصْحَابِ الْحَدِيثِ as for the virtuous or meritorious acts, they follow the methodology of the people of Hadith. Now, if you look at the book of Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam al-Nawawi, there are people now who say, you have to follow the Hadith, brother. Now, we say that that's true in Fadail al-Amal. But we actually say it's prohibited for the Ammi, for a common person like ourselves, to follow the Hadith in legal rulings. We can't follow hadith in legal rules. We have to follow the scholars of hadith. Whereas in Fadail al-Amal, those virtuous and meritorious acts, when you read the Riyadh al-Salihin, and he says to do siwak before the prayer, though that's also mentioned in the books of fiqh, that's a good thing. He tells you to do certain things, days to fast that are meritorious. As long as the hadith is sound, or it's weak that has a strength that fulfills the conditions in which, like reading Yasin, over the dead, things like that. If the ulama have agreed that even though the Senate might have some weakness in it, that it's nonetheless permissible for fadail al-amal, for virtuous or meritorious acts, we follow the hadith in that. And that's why there's a great benefit in reading those books, although they should still be read with somebody who knows, who has recourse to a commentary, so that they don't misunderstand the hadith. Because, for instance, in the Riyadh al-Salihin, you will find a hadith that's related by Nu'man ibn Bashir, and it's a sahih hadith that says that during the time of the Prophet, some of us used to put our ankles next to the ankles of other people in the prayer. And so you'll get these people in the masjid, they read that in Riyadh al-Salihin, and they end up having their legs spread out like he's a big time wrestler. <laughs> and he's in the prayer before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then all throughout the prayer, he'll be putting his feet next to your feet. And so you end up thinking more about this guy's feet than you do about your prayer. And this is haram. It's tashwish al musallin. He shouldn't have done that to you. I mean, I literally, I've had to repeat my prayer because of praying next to somebody. And that's my own naqs because, you know, people that have high maqam, some of the sahaba, they waited to pull arrows out of them. They waited till they went into the prayer. And that's, I mean, confirmed. Because they were in total istighraq. So that was their bunj. Whereas one has to ask, why is it that not one of the four schools of Islam put that in the mandubat or the sunan of the prayer? Not one. And then if you actually look at the hadith, analyze it, you'll see that it doesn't indicate, it says some of us. And he was actually a very young boy at that time. It might have been some of the boys in the back. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Taraso to come close. The other thing also is in that hadith, Ibn Hajar says in his commentary on it, it was hyperbole. In other words, there's no hukum on it. And then he quoted one of the tajreen who said if somebody tried to do that today, people would run away from him like a frightened uh, mule. In other words, they weren't doing it by the time of the tajreen, which must have meant that the sahaba weren't doing it because the tajreen followed the sahaba. لِمَا هُمْ عَلَيْهِ ذَلِكَ مِنَ التَّحْقِيقُ وَالتَّثْبِيتِ For the fact that these scholars, in fact, have confirmed and verified these transmissions. وَبِهَذَا الْوَجْهِ 
And from this perspective, it's understood what we mean by the consensus of following the school of the muhadithin. This is what we mean. So when we say we have to follow the hadith, it's in fadail al-amal. It's in meritorious acts. It's not in the ahkam. In the ahkam, we follow the fuqaha. And the fuqaha follow the usuliyin. And the usuliyun, they're the ones that derive from the hadith, the rulings. Because most of the fuqaha are not usulis. The usuli is a specialization. The faqih is somebody who learned the furu'a. I mean, there are many fuqaha that were also great usulis. Like Imam al-Ghazali, anhu, Imam Nawawi. I mean, there are many, many great ones. Qada Iyal. And these people were fuqaha and usulis. Radiallahu anhum. And then he says... And because of what's mentioned in the actions of those who are steadfast. كان الجنيد ثوريا Imam al-Junaid is called Imam al-Qa'ifatayn. The Imam of the two groups. The people of the inward and the outward. In the outward he was a thawri and he was a mushtahid muqayyid within that madhab. So he reached a very high rank of outward fiqh. When muhasibi shafi'iyan Imam al-Muhasibi was a shafi'i Madhab. Al-Harith al-Muhasibi was uh, one of the great scholars of the 3rd century and he was also a Sufi and he followed the Shabi. Al-Shibli was Maliki. So Imam al-Shibli who was a Qadi, he was also a great Sufi. He was a student of Imam al-Junaid and even uh, Ahmed ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says Faqiyuddin ibn Taymiyyah says that Imam al-Junaid and Imam Shibli are imams that are agreed upon. There's no debate about their imamah. These were imams. So there's no khilaf. And they were Sufis. And they did use that term. Well, Jurairiyu Hanafiyan. Imam al-Jurairi was a Hanafi scholar. Well, Jilani Hanbaliyan. And Sidi Abdul Qadir Jilani, one of the greatest scholars of the history of Islam, who was both an outward and an inward scholar. He'd mastered the sciences of both the outward and the inward. He was a Hanbali. He followed the Hanbali Madhab. Iraghidi Dalik, and on and on. All of the Imams, the great Imams, Imam al Ghazali was a Shafi'i, Imam al Tahawi was a Hanafi. They all followed these.